Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Welcome everyone to our second law science event. I am Vanessa Villanueva, a JSD candidate from the University of Illinois College of Law, and I will be also the moderator of this session. I will start with a brief introduction uh, of the Law Science Project. It's uh, an academic initiative coordinated by a group of JSD candidates who share the same belief in legal methodologies that has been often understood as a discipline distinct from hard sciences and traditionally consist enough the primary analysis and normative questions. The Law Science Project aims to show through this series of interdisciplinary talks that legal research can be improved and benefit from scientific methodologies. That provides systematic ways to approach questions and deliver falsifiable claims. If you want to learn more about the Law Science Project, please visit our website. And you can also join our mailing list that is going to be dropped now uh, on the chat box. To that end, I want to introduce our coordinators, um, Daniel Fifty, who is here today with us, a JSD candidate from Cornell Law School, Simonson, and uh, the founder of the co-founder of this initiative and SJD at Indiana University Modern School of Law. We also have Patrick uh, Tunchawan, who is a JSD candidate from the Law School at the University of Chicago. And we also have a JSD and JSP uh, representatives from the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Virginia. Um, I'm not sure if Kathy already joined us. Um, otherwise, I will um, start uh, with uh, introducing our speaker today. So we are very honored to have Professor Lawrence Holland with us for our spring 2023. Uh, he is an internationally recognized legal theorist who works in constitutional theory, procedure, and the philosophy of law. Solon's original theory of the fundamental nature and purpose of law virtue jurisprudence has been debated and discussed in Asia, Europe, and North America. He also works on problems of law and technology, including internet governance, copyright policy, and patent law. His path-breaking article, Legal Person Proof for Artificial Intelligence, published in the early 1990s, is widely acknowledged as far ahead of his time, and I truly recommend this article. Prior to joining the UVA Law Faculty in 2020, he was a member of the faculty at Georgetown University, at the University of Illinois, the University of San Diego, and Loyola Marymount University, and visited also at Boston University and the University of Southern California. So Professor uh, Solomon is going to give us, uh, he's also the editor of a legal theory blog. If you have not visited his blog, you should. Uh, it's an incredible source of amazing information regarding articles. And today he's going to give us a talk about originalist methodology. Now, the floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I, uh, if someone could give me a thumbs up, have I successfully shared my screen? I see I have. OK, great. Uh, so my topic today is originalist methodology. Uh, and I want to stress that today's talk is about the methodology part of originalism as a general theory uh, of the meaning of legal texts uh, and not just as a constitutional theory. So what I won't be discussing today is uh, the normative part of originalism, that is normative justifications for an originalist approach. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about how to do originalism in a wide variety of contexts and not why to do originalism. So, but I'm going to start with a very brief overview of originalism itself. I'm going to talk a little bit then about models of legal communication, about the, the general question as to how legal texts communicate. Uh, and that will lead us into the philosophy of language and theoretical linguistics. I will be talking about semantics, roughly the meaning of words and phrases, and then associated ideas about the contribution of syntax 
to meaning. And I will transition then to pragmatics, uh, which is all about the role of context in the production of meaning by legal texts. Uh, that will lead to a brief discussion of the interpretation construction distinction, uh, which is all about the relationship between meaning or communicative content on the one hand, and legal effect or legal doctrines and the decision of cases on the other hand. Uh, from there, I want to go to the fixation thesis, a claim uh, central to originalism about the when of communication. When is meaning fixed? Uh, and uh, that will lead to a discussion of historical semantics and then uh, a discussion of methods for the recovery of what are called pragmatic enrichments, the various ways in which context produces meaning that is not explicitly encoded in legal texts. So that's the plan. You begin with originalism. So um, originalism as a general idea in legal theory, of course, uh, originated in the context of constitutional interpretation. The word originalism was coined by uh, then professor, later Dean Paul Brest, of Stanford Law School uh, in a famous article that named originalism and then critiqued it, uh, the misleading quest for the original understanding. So that was all the way back in 1980, uh, now uh, 43 years ago. Uh, uh, originalism in the constitutional domain was really is really a family of theories. There's there are flavors of constitutional originalism, uh, but uh, uh, the family uh, has uh, sort of a core, a couple of ideas that are common to almost all theories that describe themselves as originalist, and these two ideas are the fixation thesis and the constraint principle. So the idea of the fixation thesis is that um, meaning, or more precisely, communicative content, the content conveyed by legal text is fixed at the time uh, the text is drafted and um, somehow promulgated enacted, in the cases of the United States Constitution, ratified, in the case of a written contractual agreement, ratified or signed, that the moment or period of fixation is crucial to meaning, and that meaning is fixed at this time. And I'll talk more about the fixation thesis soon. The fixation thesis is joined uh, in originalist theory by the constraint principle. So in the constitutional context, the constraint principle is uh, the claim that the original meaning of the constitutional text or the communicative content of the constitutional text ought to be binding. It ought to constrain constitutional actors. And then similar claims could be made about statutes. This could be a statutory fixation thesis and a statutory constraint principle, or a contractual fixation thesis and a contractual constraint principle. So I've done work on both of the, those contexts. In my current project, uh, you know, the project that I'm devoting most of my time to right now is called statutory originalism, and it's about the application of originalist ideas to statutory interpretation. So the form of constitutional originalism uh, that uh, predominates, this is the form of constitutional uh, originalism that is affirmed by all of the originalists on the United States Supreme Court and every 
uh, federal court of appeals judge who has identified as an originalist is called public meaning originalism. And what differentiates public meaning originalism from other forms of originalism is the public meaning thesis, that is, the claim that the original meaning of the constitutional text is best understood as its public meaning, or to put it a little differently, that the communicative content of the constitutional text should be viewed as the content communicated to the public by the text at the time it was framed and ratified. There are other forms of originalism. There's something called original methods originalism that denies the public meaning thesis and instead claims that the constitution was intended to be understood only by lawyers. Um, but in the constitutional sphere, almost all, but not all originalists are public meaning originalists. I've been talking about the constitutional context, but uh, originalism can be applied uh, uh, whenever we are interpreting a legal text. And so another important form of, orig of originalism is statutory originalism. Uh, and really statutory originalism and constitutional originalism are mostly the same theory. And statutory originalism is, I think, best understood as a form of textualism, uh, but it is a, the form of textualism that emphasizes the idea that the meaning of a statutory text is its original meaning, fixed at the time the statute was drafted and enacted. So I want to make another point that's very important, and that is that meaning or communicative content is relevant to non-originalist theories. Uh, so in the constitutional realm, for example, one of the chief rivals of originalism is constitutional pluralism, or sometimes this is called the multiple modalities theory. This is the theory that there are many relevant considerations for constitutional interpretation, uh, including the meaning of the text, but not limited to that, and also including precedent, historical practice, constitutional values, uh, theories of institutional competence and capabilities. There are different lists of what the modalities are, uh, and that list is just illustrative. So one of the modalities is the textualist modality, and one could be a constitutional pluralist, but still believe that the fixed original meaning of the constitutional text is one of the modalities, and therefore um, a relevant uh, and uh, part of uh, 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 the best practice of constitutional interpretation and construction. Uh, and likewise, in the statutory realm, you could be an objective purposivist. You could believe that the best way to uh, interpret and construe statutes proceeds from the objective purpose of the statute, which might be operationalized as the purpose the statute would have, ha would have had if it had been enacted by an ideal legislature concerned only with the public good or common good. Uh, uh, original meaning is relevant to objective purposivism because in order to determine uh, what the purpose of a text is, you need to figure out what the text says, because you are asking the question, not what is the purpose of the bare markings of the, on the page, you're asking the question as to what purpose one would have had in promulgating this content, the set of ideas, the set of propositions communicated by the text. So original meaning ought to be relevant to everyone who's engaged in the interpretation of legal texts, even if there is a divide between originalists who think that original meaning is binding 
and other theorists who think that original meaning is relevant but not binding. So how does legal communication work? You know, talk about models of legal communication or theories for the understanding of legal communication. And I want to start with sort of the most widely accepted uh, theoretical position in the philosophy of language and theoretical linguistics. This is an entire sort of family of theories, not just one theory, but this family sort of has a grandparent, uh, uh, and that person was Paul Grice. So um, uh, Paul Grice, uh, in very influential work, uh, done mostly in the 1960s and early 1970s, developed the idea of speaker's meaning. So, uh, and he was talking about um, uh, oral communication. So he used the word utterance uh, sort of as the technical term uh, for uh, a communicative act, for a saying of something. So Grice says that the speaker's meaning of an utterance, so the meaning of what I'm saying now is the meaning that the speaker in the case of this communication, the meaning that Solom intended to convey to an audience, to a set of listeners, that's you and you and you and you and you, uh, on the basis of the listeners grasping, the listeners getting, the listener comprehending the communicative intention of the speaker, right? So the way that communication works is I get across to you my communicative intention. I get across to you the set of ideas, the content, the set of propositions that I am int intending for you to grasp based on your recognition that that's what I'm trying to do. So you can communicate using standard meanings of words. The standard meaning of this thing, I hope everyone sort of can see what it is, right? The there's a standard word, actually there's two or three of them that you could use to refer to this thing. And I could use that word to get across my communicative intentions, but I don't have to do that. I could use a made up word. I'm gonna borrow a made up word from uh, the famous philosopher Will Willard Van Orm Orman Quine. He made up a word, gava guy, right? It's a word that had no meaning. Uh, before he used it. And for our purposes, it has no meaning until I do this, gava guy. And then I say something, right? Having done this, gava guy, then I do, I say something. I say, the gava guy is now on the screen. The gava guy is off the screen. Gava guy is back on the screen. The gava guy is off the screen. Right. So I have now successfully communicated to you using a brand new word. Right. How did that happen? You recognized my communicative intention. You recognized that by using the word Gava guy, I meant to convey something like cup or maybe this cup. Right. There might be some ambiguity in my communication, but the cup is on the screen, that's standard English. The gava guy on the screen, that's a brand new word, not part of standard English. But if you recognize my communicative intention, then I can successfully convey content you, to you. The content expressed in standard English is, the cup is now visible on the screen, and the cup is no longer visible on the screen. You got that proposition 
That is, you recovered my communicative intention. That's Grice's model. Grice assumes a face-to-face -face conversation. Well, this is almost face-to-face. -face. This is face-to-zoom-to-face, -face, right? That is cooperative, right? Cooperative. That is, I'm trying to convey one meaning to you, a set of propositions to you. I'm not trying to deceive you. I'm not trying to convey different meanings to different people in the group, right? I'm trying to successfully convey my meaning to you. You're trying to recover the meaning that I am trying to cooperate, to convey. We're cooperating. Okay, so face-to-face -face conversation, that's cooperative. Legal communication is different, substantially different. Legal communication involves multiple stages, drafting, in the case of legislation, maybe there's a committee, there might be a bicameral legislature, there might be some kind of an executive who has a veto or signature power and so forth, multiple stages. Legal communication is sometimes strategic. Legal communicators sometimes are drafting statutes in ways that are intentionally deceptive. And legal communication involves distinctive second order communicative intentions. So I'm gonna be relying on this distinction between first order communicative intentions. That would be the intention to convey the proposition, the cup is visible on the screen. That's a first order communicative intention. But I also have a second order communicative intention, which is to convey the meaning captured by the Gricean idea of speaker's meaning. That is to convey meaning via your recognition of my communicative intentions. Okay, that's a crash course in Grice. Now, to extend the Gricean model, we need a more complex model. So here's a more complex model, but still simple, super simple, right? Actual statutory communication is more complicated than this. But in statutory communication, someone drafts, right? Someone writes the text. In the United States, typically, statutory texts are written outside of the legislative body. Most statutory texts are written by special interest groups who then provide the text to a legislature. It goes through a process in Congress, for example, a crucial stage is called markup, when key players all sit around a desk and go through the statute uh, st uh, sentence by sentence, agreeing, sometimes making changes. And then it would go to a committee vote and a floor vote. And then, for instance, in the case of Congress, it would be presented to the president to a signature. And then it would be published and read by its ultimate audience. So all of these stages, markup, we're reading the draft, committee, we're meet, reading the product of markup, floor vote, we're reading the committee draft presentation, the president is reading the draft or the president's advisors is reading the VAT draft uh, that was actually passed by the legislature. And then finally, publication, courts, people who are affected by the legislature, lawyers read the draft. So this is a multi-stage process. And that multi-stage process involves a second order communicative intention that I want to say crucially is a function of the primary intended audience of the statute. So who's the primary intended audience of a statute? That depends. In the case of the United States Constitution, the primary intended audience was the public. The Constitution was read to be understood by all citizens. In the case of a statute, that's not necessarily the case. Some statutes are written to have ordinary meaning that would be comprehensible to regular people. 
But other statutes are written for specialized audiences. For example, regulatory statutes are frequently written for the regulated industry. And the regulators, the government officials who do the regulation, and that audience may employ a specialized vocabulary. So those statutes may not have ordinary meaning. They may have what's called technical meaning. They may pervasively employ terms of art. There are other effects of these second order communicative intentions as well. So regulatory statute aims to communicate to the regulated industry and the regulators that is the relevant second order communicative intention. This brings us to se semantics and pragmatics, the two branches of the study of meaning in the philosophy of language and theoretical linguistics. So semantics, we're talking about the meaning of words and phrases Right? What do individual words mean? What Sometimes the unit of meaning is not a word, but it's a phrase. All lawyers know this, that the phrase meaning may be different from the compositional meaning of the individual words that make up the phrase, plus syntax or grammar. And of course, crucially important with written text, punctuation, because you can completely change the meaning of a legal text uh, by changing the punctuation of the text. So that's on the semantic side of the ledger. Pragmatics deals with the role of context. There are different technical definitions of pragmatics, but this definition that pragmatics is about the role of context is the easiest to understand. And it, in some sense, uh, captures the other theories of what pragmatics is about. So semantic meaning is sparse. This is crucially important. The literal meaning of statutory texts does not convey the full meaning. Literal meaning, just the meaning of the words, fails to capture much of what is actually conveyed. So in order to recover the communicative content of a statute or constitutional provision or contractual provision, we need to look for contextual disambiguation. Words in English, like almost every word in English, has a whole bunch of meanings. Common words frequently have 40 or 50 meanings, right? Context enables to figure us to figure out which of those meanings is the intended meaning, the, which meaning is part of the communicative intention of the drafter. Uh, and there's something called pragmatic or contextual enrichment, and that's going to turn out to be just very important. So what is pragmatic enrichment? Pragmatic enrichment involves content that is unstated. So um, here are some examples. These are technical terms. I'm gonna just do one of these. We can talk about the others. These are four different forms of pragmatic enrichment. Let me do implicature number two uh, on the bullet points. Here's an example of implicature. I say to you, Jack and Jill are married. But what have I conveyed? In most contexts, Jack and Jill are married conveys Jack and Jill are married to each other. The to each other is communicated, but unstated. Legal texts are full of implicitures. Almost every statute has meaning that is not stated, but that is implicit in what is said. One example of this is geographic scope restrictions, right? So the United States Constitution is full of, prop, uh, full of sentences with no geographic scope. But many of the provisions of the United States Constitution implicitly include a qualifier that goes something like, in the United States, right? The freedom of speech shall not be abridged 
in the United States, the First Amendment to the United States Constitution has no application in France or very limited application if it has any. And there's contextual disambiguation, which I've already mentioned. Words have multiple meanings, context disambiguates. Okay, another idea, another big important idea, the interpretation construction distinction. So communicative content is recovered by uh, interpretation. Legal content, like the legal content of doctrines is recovered by uh, interpretation. What do I mean by content? I mean an abstract object. So words and phrases represent concepts, the same concept can be represented by different words in different languages. Law is law in English, but it might be recht in German. Uh, uh, it might be lay in Spanish and so forth. So same concept, different verbal expressions. Propositions are just whole sentences. A proposition is the conceptual equivalent of a sentence. So interpretation is the discovery of communicative content. Construction is the determination of legal effect. Some times the communicative content is underdeterminate, and that gives rise to what are called construction zones. Okay, the fixation thesis. The fixation thesis is the idea that communicative content is fixed at the time we say something or write something, right? So for the Constitution of the United States, content is fixed at the time each provision is framed and ratified. Why is this important? It's important because of linguistic drift. Words change meaning over time. So here are some examples. The United States Constitution in Article 4 uses the phrase domestic violence. Today, that means violence within a family, elder abuse, spousal abuse, but it didn't have that meaning in 1791. In 1791, the phrase domestic violence referred to political violence within a state, riots, insurrections, rebellions. So if we want to know the meaning of Article 4 of the Constitution, we need to look at the meaning of the phrase domestic violence as of 1787 through 1789, the period during which drafting and ratification occurred. Or here's another example, the word dollar. People assume that in the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, which has a $20 limit for the right to jury trial, that the word dollar refers to contemporary American dollars. Well, once you say it that way, it's obvious it couldn't mean that. What did it mean? There were no American dollars in 1791. There were Spanish silver dollars. And the word dollar in the Seventh Amendment refers to the Spanish silver dollar. The complete phrase is value of dollar. That refers to the value associated with that silver content. So the fixed original meaning of dollar is very different than the contemporary meaning. Content is fixed at the time legal communication occurs. This is true for statutes, for, for contract drafting, and so on. And fixation becomes more relevant as legal texts age. So an old statute, there's more linguistic drift. In the United States, many of the most important statutes at the federal level go all the way back to 1791 in the first Congress. And so to figure out what those statutes mean, we need to look to linguistic practice as of 1791. So how do we recover fixed original meaning? We need to do historical semantics. And how can we do that? Well, we could do it with our contemporary linguistic intuitions, but that is problematic. We used our contemporary linguistic intuitions. Domestic violence would mean spousal abuse, and dollar would mean uh, uh, fiat currency issued by the Federal Reserve Board, and those are not the historical meanings. We could look to period dictionaries. That's a good first start. Looking to period dictionaries is all well and good. Not that we shouldn't do that. But dictionaries are extremely problematic for reasons that are familiar to anyone who, who knows 
uh, linguistics. So um, uh, in order to recover uh, the historical meaning, we need more scientific techniques. This is the law uh, as science seminar. And, and what does science tell us about this question? Well, now we're talking about the scientific methods of linguistics and in particular corpus linguistics. Corpus linguistics, which many of you may already be familiar with, uses large databases. There are many specific methods that can be used to investigate such data, right? At the simplest level, it would involve uh, uh, querying a database from the relevant historical period and then coding the results, hand coding. You need blind coding by at least two coders to do it really well. Um, but there are other techniques that involve um, uh, 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 the use of sort of complex um, uh, uh, programming techniques uh, that allow uh, for the discovery of linguistic associations. And we are getting very close. And when I say very close, I, think I really mean very, very close to artificially intelligent systems that will be able to do this uh, uh, in a way that will dramatically change the way that we investigate historical meanings. I, 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 predictions are perilous, but I predict that no later than five years from today, uh, corpus linguistics will mostly be done by artificial intelligence. And then there's immersion. This is the brute force method. You read everything yourself so that you train yourself to be a competent speaker of the language at the historical period. Obviously, this requires a lot of work. Uh, and it's mo this kind of research is mostly done by historians. What about pragmatic enrichment? right, where you have to recover the context of legal communication. One way to do that is by studying the record. So in constitutional law, people study the constitutional record. In uh, statutory interpretation, people study legislative history, but you need to go broad, not narrow. So when we study the constitutional record, it's not just the Constitutional Convention and the ratifying debates, it's the intellectual background, uh, the sources read by people at the time, and a similar process takes place for doing the kind of legislative history necessary to recover the context so that we can discover pragmatic enrichments. The shared context of legal communication, right? This is the context shared by the drafters and the legislature on the one hand, and the intended audience, on the other hand, we call that common knowledge. Common knowledge here is a technical term from game theory, and it's appropriated in theoretical linguistics to capture the idea of a shared context of communication. So that I went over a little bit. I'm so sorry for that. But I think we still have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to stop the share, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I think uh, Simon may have um, control of the um, seat. So we have Marilyn, she's from the University of Virginia. Please, Marilyn, do you have a question? Oh, no, I was just applauding. <laughs> <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you. I think this was a wonderful presentation. It was very uh, good to follow. And for me, as someone who knows more about like the theoretical discussion uh, behind it, but not really about the methodology as such, I think this was super interesting. Um, my question is about the communicative intention. So um, as you described it, or as I understood it, the, um, the methodology aims to discover and correctly describe the communicative uh, intention. And obviously this presupposes that there is one communicative intention uh, that one can discover, right? So um, my question is, how do you deal with 
these uh, like three scenarios. So first, you have a plurality of speakers, which you always have in, in legislative um, acts, um, who will or can have a plurality of, of intentions. Uh, then second, even if you have one speaker, uh, he or she might speak in ambivalent or ambiguous terms on, on purpose. So maybe he or she doesn't really want her uh, intentions to be clearly understood. And uh, third, if there is if there is a clear and conscious communicative intention, but psychology would tell us, you know, there's maybe a different or an additional intention unaware lying underneath. Is that an uh, um, an intention worth worth studying as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, a deep question, actually three deep questions. So uh, the first question uh, that Daniel asks uh, concerns uh, the fact that legislative bodies or uh, constitutional conventions and sometimes contractual drafting involves multiple participants, right? So um, uh, we need a model that accounts for how the communicative intentions of multiple participants in a complex multi-stage process of legal communication can mesh. I'm using this word mesh, right? It's a technical term uh, uh, for the purposes of uh, theoretical discussion. So, if, communi if communicative intentions mesh, then we can uh, convey meaning despite the existence of multiple participants in a complex process that's extended over time, right? Because they're not all together in the room at the same time. Okay, so um, here, here is a uh, 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 an account. There are multiple possible solutions to this problem, but, but here is an account. I think this is the simplest and in some sense, the strongest account. So the meaning of any particular piece of uh, uh, t legal text, a constitutional provision, a statutory provision, uh, always begins with a single drafter. Right, a statute may have individual fragments of text drafted by different people, but each fragment of text is drafted by one person. Um, you can imagine science fiction scenarios with like group minds, uh, or somehow people uh, working together to control a single pen. Right, but but. But, but those are very unusual. So the drafter has a communicative intention, which the drafter attempts to convey to an audience. And the immediate audience of the drafter is the next stage in the multi-stage process. So in the case of the United States Constitution, almost all of it, not all, but almost all of it was drafted by one person in 1787. That person was named Governor Morris. He was the, uh, the drafts person. He wielded the pen. And his communicative intentions were conveyed to a committee, the Committee on Style. And they just did the normal Gricean thing. They attempted to understand his communicative intentions. Uh, and if he's done a good job of drafting, then his communicative intentions are conveyed to this larger group. The group then passes on the text to another group, the floor of the convention. Same thing happens. The people on the floor attempt to uh, uh, recover the communicative intentions of the committee which they know are uh, a function of the communicative intentions of the drafter. So if the drafter conveys meaning to the committee and the committee 
conveys meaning to the floor, and the floor conveys meaning to the uh, ratifying conventions, despite the existence of multiple participants, communicative intentions can mesh. That sounds complicated, but it is so simple, and it happens every day. We read texts that are written through complex multi-stage processes. We don't, you don't need to know Gricean theory to understand that when you read a text that was written in this kind of way, in a multi-stage process, that you can recover meaning based on an understanding of the communicative situation. Let me give another example. It's very simple. You come to a fence out there in the countryside and you see a sign that says, no trespassing. The person who wrote the sign is not the person who posted the sign. And you have no idea who wrote the sign, none. Some sign writer somewhere wrote the sign. You know, this text probably was originally written many, many decades ago, right? And you don't even know who posted the sign. You have no idea who put the sign on the fence. But you know that the drafter of No Trespassing and the poster of the no trespassing sign were trying to communicate meaning that was accessible to people who come across signs, the kind of people who might trespass if they didn't understand the sign. And so you are able to recover the communicative intentions, despite the fact that it's a multi-stage process, despite the fact that the individual psychologies can differ. So. That's the model. That's the assumption about how the process works. Daniel, could you remind me of your set? That was long. Can you remind me of your second question quickly? Uh, so it's basically about if the um, communicative intention is um, is ambiguous, ambiguous on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in the standard case, uh, we hope that legal communication is reasonably cooperative. Right, but um, it's not. That's not always the case. Someone might draft a constitutional provision intending to convey multiple meanings. That or a statute. Same thing. There could be uh, a, a statutory provision that's drafted so that it can appeal to both sides of a debate that could not be resolved in the legislative process. This is a fairly common phenomenon. Um, so it. In that case, there are two meanings. They're both truly meanings. They are both meanings that were intended to be conveyed to two different audiences. That creates a construction zone. This is a special kind of underdeterminacy. The law will need to use normative principles of some kind in order to resolve what we do in those cases. That's a complex problem. I've, just, I'm not got, I've got a whole theory as to how we deal with those problems, but I, I, it, it, I would just be going on and on and on if I gave you that theory. The third question was about the psychological states uh, that are unconscious. I've never been asked that question before, Daniel. Thank you for the question. I have to, I don't wanna, I don't even wanna speculate about what answer I should give to that question. I just wanna take that question under advisement. Thank you very much. And uh, we have Simon and then uh, Hiranima. Simon? Yes. Um, so I have, um, I think, three kind of broad uh, questions here. Um, at Law Science, we, we, we like to talk about general methodology, things that can encompass a lot of different, um, different things, or at least it's, it can be a general approach. So um, on that regard, would you say the originalist approach is actually a general approach that every single um, judge should 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 apply to, and um, or or how would this con in contrast to other uh, methodological approach that might even stand a chance, you know, to to stand against? Because I, as I understand, this 
links to linguistic and has a very, very strong, um, strong foundation um, there. The second is a specifically in Simon, on... could I could I interrupt? Can I just answer this question first, and then yes, and then yes. you do your second question? So, um, uh, is this a general approach, and should all judges follow it? Right. So, uh, on the first part, it is a completely general approach. Right. So, what we're doing is we're we we've got legal texts. We want to figure out what they mean and uh, uh, sort of uh, contemporary theoretical linguistics and the philosophy of language provide us with a set of tools for developing an approach that always can be used to recover the meaning of any legal text, right? And there could be debates about whether this is the right theory or the wrong theory. I believe it's the right theory. And furthermore, at least in theoretical linguistics, there's a strong consensus that it's the right theory. Um, uh, in, in the philosophy of language, there's more dispute. You know, we might want, as lawyers, we might want to be aware of those disputes. Should judges use it? Right. So that's a different question. I believe every judge should use this theory regardless of their normative theories of constitutional interpretation or statutory interpretation or contractual interpretation. And the reason for that is no matter what your normative theory is, whether you're an originalist or a living constitutionalist, everyone who is sensible ought to think it is at least relevant to know what the text means even if you believe judges have a power to override the text, you would want to know what the text means before you override it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, you know, because obviously if you don't need to override it, you wouldn't want to do that. And even if you do override it, you might think that you need some kind of special justification for doing that. So everyone ought to know what texts mean. More controversially, originalists believe that what judges do ought to be constrained by the original meaning of the text. That's controversial. Some people accept that proposition. I think you're having Erwin Chimerinsky here uh, next week. Erwin is going to completely reject that idea, right, that the text ought to be constraining. Likewise, there are different theories of statutory interpretation. Okay, that's the first question. You've got a second question. Yeah, the second is building on that, and you talked about artificial intelligence on its impact. So, and you said, you know, within five years, it's going to, you know, it's going to revolutionize um, a lot of things. So could you kind of talk a little bit more on kind of the prediction on at least the originalist community, how would that impact, or maybe broadly, but in the originalist community, how would this impact the discussion on, um, again, the methodology itself, how AI would impact um, how people understand um, the original meaning, the original intent of uh, the constitutional text. Yeah, so um, uh, it, it, I can only speculate exactly how it's all going to go, right? And, and obviously, um, uh, I, I could easily be wrong. But here's my speculation. I think what's going to happen, so, so uh, corpus linguistics uses uh, a set of techniques that essentially allow us to look at big amounts of data and then translate the meaning of words and phrases and then, you know, at a, at a larger level, whole sentences or whole statutes or whole clauses of the Constitution into contemporary vocabulary. This process of translation is what we are aiming for. We've got a text written in 1787 English. We're trying to translate it into 2023 English. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that process, um, assuming you accept sort of the um, a standard theory in the philosophy of mind and cognitive science, the computational theory of mind, that process can be duplicated by an artificial intelligence. 
So the idea is that you will be able to uh, have an artificial intelligence that can process vast amounts of linguistic data, amounts of linguistic data that could never be processed by hand coding. Uh, and uh, if if this is successful, which it might or not might not be, but assuming that the development of such programs is successful, we would get objective answers to the question of what is the original public meaning of a particular per part of the constitutional text. It might be that a really good artificial intelligence would sometimes spit out the answer that, um, well, the original meaning of this text might be A or it might be B, but I don't have enough data to decide as between A or B, right? And other provisions, it might, it might be different. In fact, it might be that someday artificial intelligences are able to apply the original meaning to the facts of a particular case. So um, uh, 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 that's the way I think it will go. Uh, and I think we'll, I'm not, I don't know how far we will have gone in five years, but I'm pretty sure that we will have replaced hand coding with something done by an artificial intelligence in about five years. That might be, might be pessimistic. It might be a little bit optimistic, but I think that something like that is in the ballpark of the kind of progress we'll make. Well, thank you. That'll be an exciting future. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, Geronimo. Would you like me to introduce briefly before you uh, speak your question? Thank you so much, Professor Solom. My name is Geronimo Lavolverni. I'm doing my SGD at UVA. Um, and we met a couple of years ago when you visited Argentina. I don't know if you remember in 2019. Yes, I do, of course. Yeah, we, we, we shared lunch and actually it was the first time that I heard about originalism. And since then I've been very interested in reading your, your works, um, your papers. So I have a question about your last paper published with Randy Barnett. I read it and I would like to ask you if you could please explain how the history and tradition approach can be used by living constitutionalism and by originalism? And how's the way, how is the way that the originalistic approach could deal with this, this history and tradition concept using the fixation thesis? And if you could give examples uh, from both sides. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, the Supreme Court um, has, um, talked about history and tradition for a long time, but uh, th the focus on those two ideas became especially salient and important this past term of the Supreme Court, which handed down three big decisions in June, Dobbs, the abortion decision, Bruin, a gun control decision, and uh, Kennedy, it, which was a decision about um, the religion clauses of the First Amendment as applied to the states. All three opinions used history and tradition. And in all three opinions, dissenting or concurring justices said, this is something new and important. Uh, so what was going on? So uh, in the paper, uh, uh, that you referenced, uh, Professor Barnett and I suggest that there are three different possible roles for history and tradition. So the first role um, is within originalism. So both history and tradition are relevant to originalism. I'm just going to give two examples. The paper does a lot more with this. Um, history. Well, obviously, history is very relevant to originalism because historical evidence is the way that we determine what the original public meaning of the constitutional text is. So, and that includes uh, history that leads up to a constitutional provision. It includes early historical practice, which provides us evidence of meaning 
and so forth. So history is clearly is clearly relevant. Traditions can be relevant for that purpose, but here's another way tradition can play a role. The Seventh Amendment to the Constitution says that the right to jury trial at common law shall be preserved, preserved, right? And the standard interpretation of that provision is that the thing that is preserved is the tradition of jury trials as it existed in England as of 1791. So we need to look at English traditional law to determine what the right to jury trial actually contains. So that's completely consistent with originalism. Constitutional pluralists also can use history and tradition, and they can use it in the same way originalists do, because text is part of constitutional pluralism, but they can use it in different ways as well. So in the article, Professor Barnett and I speculate that what might be emerging is what we call conservative constitutional pluralism with the word conservative uh, uh, designating that there is a form of constitutional pluralism that sort of excludes present values, present meanings, and a sort of approach to, to precedent to stare decisis that focuses on the contemporary period, instead looks only backward. So that approach to constitutional pluralism would be conservative because it would include only the backward looking modalities of constitutional argument and exclude the forward looking modalities of constitutional argument like contemporary values. Um, and I think that I don't want to say too much more about this because I want to get to other questions, but I think that um, one of the things that's very important here is to, to realize that the, the court is really divided on this. Justices Gorsuch and Thomas, I think, are much more focused on an originalist approach to history and tradition. But especially Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Alito, I think, are much more conservative constitutional pluralists. There's a third and much more radical possibility that is now being discussed a lot, not on the Supreme Court, but by constitutional theorists. So we call this third approach um, historical traditionalism. And this is the idea that we would not use multiple modalities. We would use one modality, the modality of historical tradition to determine the content of constitutional law. And there are a couple of theorists who have been floating this idea. Uh, Professor Mark De Girolami is sort of the, the leading figure. And just recently, um, uh, there is a, an article critiquing this approach uh, that has uh, been posted on SSRN uh, by uh, Professor Joel uh, Alessia. Uh, so it's th this third thing is more a theory now than it is judicial practice. Uh, thank you. Thank then you. we have Ali. Well, we we have um, if if you professor have still time to answer a couple of questions, uh, we can continue. We have Howardly. Um, I just want to ask everyone to um, to just ask very, very short and then five questions because we're probably reached the limit for this talk. Okay, go ahead, Howard. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Professor, for the awesome talk. So I, I see the originalism actually based on the presumption that the, the language uh, represents the meaning of the, the data, for example. But, but I wonder uh, what if in the situation that the drafter actually act in a um, subconscious way or even lie, for example. So how does the originalism count, account for this kind of situation? Yeah, so let me give an example of this. Um, a, a constitutional example. So, um, uh, Professor John McHale at Georgetown University 
my former colleague and one of the great historical uh, uh, constitutional historians of our age, uh, I think, a relatively young man, but someone who has really uh, 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 sort of uh, established their credibility, uh, has argued that um, the uh, structure of Article One in relationship to um, the preamble of the Constitution uh, involves a very, very clever drafting process that was designed to disguise the conferral of unlimited legislative power on the national government through subterfuge. So the subterfuge is this, that Article 1, Section 8, enumerates a bunch of specific powers. The power to raise armies and navies, the power to coin money, the power to create intellectual property in authors and inventors, and so on. Very detailed specific powers, conveying a sense uh, via a pragmatic enrichment that the federal government had limited and enumerated powers. And then the necessary and proper clause would be understood as allowing incidental means to effectuate the enumerated powers, right? So we have then a scheme of limited and enumerated powers. And that's the way the constitution was defended by the federalists, by the pro-nationalists. Uh, during the ratification process. But Professor McHale says that, in fact, uh, that was smoke and mirrors, that what the drafting actually did was to confer unlimited national power in a very clever way. So if you read the necessary and proper clause carefully, you discover it's not one clause there are actually three different necessary and proper clauses, sort of all smushed together. So the second of the three clauses gives Congress the power to do anything necessary and proper to effectuate the powers vested, not in Congress, but in, quote, the government of the United States. And then Professor McKyle says that was combined with the preamble to the Constitution that says that, you know, the uh, purpose of the Constitution, this Constitution is hereby, or we the people hereby ordain and establish this Constitution in order to, and then national defense, general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty. So that's a preamble. And Professor McHale says, unknown to the public, there was well-established law which indicated that a preamble of a corporate charter was a power conferring provision. It conferred powers on the government of the United States and the necessary and proper clause now allows Congress to do anything that would advance the general welfare, the national defense or the bless or to secure the blessings of liberty. So that means virtually unlimited national power. So if this story is correct, then the drafters, who this was Governor Morris, who I mentioned, and then another very clever lawyer, J uh, 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 James Wilson. Wilson and Morris wrote a constitution that conveyed one meaning to the general public and a different meaning that could then be taken advantage of by the Federalists once they got power. And in fact, that's what they did. Starting with the first Congress, then after they'd been saying no limited and enumerated powers during the ratification period, then they started to say, no, unlimited national power. We have the power to do anything that advances the general welfare, the national defense, or secures the blessing of, blessings of liberty under the necessary and proper clause under subclause two. And then the anti-federalists said, you're cheating, right? That's not fair. You told us that it was limited enumerated powers, and now you're telling us that it's unlimited power. So what do we do about that? This is a matter for constitutional construction. 
we can't just recover the meaning of the text because it turns out the text was written very cleverly to convey two different meanings simultaneously. So we need a theory of constitutional construction. So that's, if all of the constitution were like that, we'd have a really huge problem because the constitution would from top to bottom be radically ambiguous, but it's not all like that. But of course, this one thing is hugely important because it determines the scope of national power. And we can't resolve this question just on the basis of interpretation. We have to go to construction in order to resolve this kind of a problem. Uh, thank you, Professor. I just have a link to for one more question from the chat, uh, which is from Chen Chen Chen. When the legislative intent conflicts with the recipient's understanding, how to solve this conflict? I, you're, uh, for me, you're um, somewhat muffled. So this is, uh, uh, the quet in the chat, this is the question that's the second mm -hmm. most recent question. Uh, by Chang Chung, uh, a question. Oh, oh okay. Yes. I just need to try to locate this question in the chat. Yeah. When, when legislative intent conflicts with the recipient's understanding, how do we solve this conflict? Um, so um, first thing, so you're talking about a situation in which the communicative intention of a drafter is not successfully conveyed to the audience, right? So we have a technical name for this. This it, 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 the word that is used in the philosophy of language and theoretical linguistics is misfire, right? So the communicative act misfires and we don't get the intention across. So, Public meaning originalism says that in that situation, in the case of the Constitution, uh, there is a first order communicative intention that's not successfully conveyed, and a second order communicative intention, which is the intention to convey public meaning. Of course, that communicative intention was successfully conveyed. The second order communicative intention everyone recognized this is a constitution that ordinary citizens are supposed to be able to understand and therefore the, con the, the intention is to convey public meaning. In that situation, public meaning originalism says the public meaning governs the second order communicative intention rather than the first order communicative intention governs and therefore it is the meaning as understood by the public that governs. And that this is not just a norm, there's a normative reason to do this. This is the meaning that was ratified, but there's also, uh, uh, but this is also in, in a real sense, the true meaning of the communication. Because if you have a second order communicative intention to convey public meaning, that the meaning you want to be understood is the meaning conveyed to the public, then in a real sense, honoring the communicative intentions of the drafters involves honoring their second order communicative intention rather than their first order communicative intention. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. We really appreciate the, uh, the time and the efforts uh, for joining us today or for answering all these questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to go into every single question. Um, now, we are, as, as we usually do, we're going to take a group picture. Hi. Yes, please uh, just turn on your camera and we can take a quick group picture. All right. Um, all right, one, two, three. Okay, I'm gonna wait for everyone. All right, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. Uh, one, two, three. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And let's catch up uh, continuously with the debate next session with Professor Erwin Chamarinsky. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Salu. Thank you. Bye bye. See you next week. Bye.